A words of introduction to uh, today's tonight's event. It's about Italy and Norway. It is about Oslo and Venice. We have three events in 72 hours. One big event is going to take place on Sunday in Oslo at the Oslo Opera, where the uh, Oslo Music Camera Academy, led by Paul Kirby, whom I greet, will offer a concert of 18th century music with some readings in English from uh, the letters of Giacomo of Casano. In Italy, in San Diego, near Venice tonight, we celebrate the start of the beginning of the, the traditional Italian Norwegian days, a whole weekend of celebrations organized by the Brotherhood of the Norwegian Stockfish. That's why I'm wearing the insignia of that association tonight. I'm an honorary member of uh, that Brotherhood, which is very important economically, culturally, and politically. Because we Italians, we import a lot of uh, stockfish, turkeys from Norway, and we transform it into a very typical Italian plate, which is uh, eaten in Venice, in Genoa, in Sicily, all over Italy. I think this is a wonderful example of cooperation between the two countries, and a beautiful example of a perfect win-win situation, because we buy fish from Norway and we transform it and we sell it again. Conversely, the Norwegians sell fish to, to us and, and then they can enjoy the way we, we prepare it. That's why celebrating the Italian Norwegian days near Venice in San Diego, uh, organized by this association of which I am a member, is in a way also a celebration of the cooperation between the two countries. And then finally, tonight. Tonight's event is a uh, sort of, uh, again, celebration of uh, uh, international cooperation. And we chose Casanova. To be more precise, Paul Kirby chose Casanova because uh, this gentleman is responsible for having chosen this person, uh, this personality of the 18th century. Who was Casanova? Casanova is known in Italy and I guess also in Norway for uh, having been a Latin lover a uh, man who really loved a lot women, but he was much more than that. He was a diplomat, he was a writer, he was a translator, he was an alchemist, he was a diplomat, he was a traveler, he was a cosmopolitan guy. And I like that very much. Because I like reality as a combination of different factors. Reality is multifaceted, can be seen from many angles. And that's why uh, what we are trying to do tonight. We consider Casanova not as a gentleman who lived in the 18th century, but more as a powerful symbol of the complexity of uh, reality and of many interconnection <coughs> links we can see in, in the world. That's why we have tonight a multifaceted approach, and we have three readings. One will be on the physical setting of Casanova. Casanova was a man of the 18th century, he was a citizen of the Republic of Venice, so let's talk a little bit about his times from a point of view of architecture. How will we take care of that? Saying a few words about the city walls of the Venetian cities in, in that period. So that in a way is the first circle. The first circle is culture. Culture is music. And Paul will again talk about the music of the 18th century, the great music of the 18th century, the music which Casanova was used to listen to, um, in which also Venice played an important role. And finally, the third circle, the inner circle, is about the intellectual legacy of Casanova, who again was international because he wrote in Italian, he wrote in French, and he wrote in Venetian. So we have some readings from his works from the three languages. And finally, just to underline again the internationality of our approach tonight, we're going to listen to translations of Casanova's works in two languages which are international by definition. English, of course, and so again, Director Paul Kirby will be kind enough uh, to read from his works, and again from Esperanto. Esperanto is an international language which was launched in 1887, is up and running today, some two million people uh, speak it. Uh, there is an academy of Esperanto, a sort of a sprack road, the corresponding sprack road of the Norwegian language, uh, of which a number of distinguished linguists uh, are members, 
among whom Professor Otto Pilzer, who is here with us tonight, Professor of Spanish at the University of Oslo, and also, as I mentioned, member of the Academy of Esperanto. He'll be kind enough to say a few words on this language in Norwegian, and then to read aloud some passages from Casanova's biography translated into Esperanto. So the gist of it all is uh, this word, global, a combination of uh, global and local. Yes, Casanova in a way was local, he was a true, a genuine Venetian, a man of the 18th century, but again a symbol for our international cooperation which is going on today. So, that was my short introduction and in a way the philosophical approach to being today. Now, I take a seat and my poor back, which is hurting so much these days, will thank me for sitting down and I'll pass on to say a few words on a fascinating initiative. UNESCO. You know what UNESCO is? Is the um, I could say the daughter organization of the United Nations in charge of the protection and promotion of the cultural uh, heritage of mankind. A few years ago, not not much time ago, but in 1972, uh, in November 1972 the General Conference of UNESCO decided to put up a list for those sites who represent um, exceptionally important heritage from the point of view of culture of uh, natural landscape. A committee was uh, uh, set up in order to overlook and steer this uh, desire to have a list of the most important components of uh, the cultural and natural heritage of our mankind. And now, after some 40 years, we have a great number of these sites. We have 1073 sites, uh, according to the latest data made available at the meeting in Krakow in July this year. You see in the map of the world that many are located in Europe, but there is a growing number of those sites in Africa, in both Americas, in Australia and in Asia. I am very proud to say that the country with the highest number of sites inscribed in this very special list of UNESCO is Italy, with 54 sites. But also Norway is faring extremely well with 8 sites. For a country with 5 million people, it's really a remarkable achievement. You see there in the Italian translation the list of the Norwegian sites. I had been, I had been fortunate enough to see seven of them. Uh, in the list you see the old district of Bregen in Bargen. You see the stuff here, here of Urnes. You see the mining city of Röros. You see the prehistoric remains in Alta, beyond the polar circle. Again, beyond the polar circle, you have the Vega area, the archipelago closer to Lofoten. Then, of course, you cannot miss the Geirangen Fjord and Nere Fjord. Uh, then you have the industrial site of Yukan Mutogden, and also the geodetic art of Struve, which is actually an international initiative of which I will take, uh, I will say a few words later on. So, eight sites are on the list on the side of Norway. Remarkable. Again, now let me come to Italy. The list is uh, longer. We have uh, 54 uh, sites. Um, I don't go through each of them. You see that there are many, but there are at least two which I would like to underline. One is uh, Matera. Matera is in southern Italy. It was inscribed in this list in 1993, and Matera in two years will be the European cultural capital. Uh, and Matera is uh, cooperating with the Norwegian city of Budo, beyond the polar circle in, uh, in this regard. And the second site, which I like a lot, which is also a recent one, is uh, located in Sicily and it is about the Norman heritage in Sicily. 
again, a connection between this beautiful country of Norway and my country. Then, since we have to talk about uh, Casanova and the mission, let's see if there are sites, uh, a UNESCO sites located in uh, Venice and in the region of Venice, appropriately called Venetia. Yes, there are many, there are five of them. First, Venice, the whole city of Venice is considered to be a UNESCO site. Then you have Vicenza, is another city some 60 kilometers uh, west of, uh, of Venice. Again, in its entirety, is considered a UNESCO site. Then we have uh, the villas built by Palladio, maybe the most uh, known architect in the history of architecture, who was actually again uh, a Venetian. Then we have the Botanical Garden in Padova, the first botanical garden which is still in use, established in 1515, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Then we have Verona, the city of Romeo and Juliet. And now let me come to the connection with Casanova. What you see there is a geographical map of all the territories which were, at one time or another, part of the Republic of Venice. As you see, this uh, state, uh, which came to an end in 1779 after a 1,000 year long history, controlled, in different periods of its history, of course, half of Lombardy, the whole of Venetia, the Dalmatian coast, most of Albania, two-thirds of, Gre of uh, Greece, Crete and Cyprus. It was in its own terms, a truly international and multicultural state in which Italians, Slavs, Albanians and Greeks lived side by side. I have one example which I'd like very much to quote. One painter, the name is El Greco. If you go to the National Gallery of Oslo, you see at least two beautiful paintings by this painter, this 16th century painter. Well, El Greco is, uh, as you know, a pseudonym. It was not its real name. He was born in Crete, in this island, under the Venetian rule, so he was born a Venetian citizen. His uh, genuine name was uh, Domenicos Theotokopoulos. He moved to Venice to study painting with uh, Titian, another great uh, Italian uh, painter. Nobody dared to call him Dominicus Protocopoulos, so he was known as the Greek guy, the Greek boy, the Venetian language, a Greco. <coughs> then he moved to Spain, where he uh, completed his, uh, his career. So whenever you hear this name in Greco, that's not Spanish, that's Venetian. Now, to control all these territories, stretching some 2,000 kilometers from uh, nearby Milan to Cyprus, you need fortifications, you need a defense structure, you need some physical buildings, and there were many. Palmanova, for instance, it's located in uh, northeastern Italy, and it's remarkable because of its shape. It resembles very much a, a star. Another fortified city was Bergamo, which is very close to Milan, it's some 30 kilometers from Milan and it's today the seat of the second busiest airport of Italy. Then again, we have Peschiera del Garda, which is between Milan and, and, and Venice. But such city walls are not only to be found in Italy. We have Venetian city walls in Zara, which is a city in, uh, along the coast of Dalmatia. The Italian name is Zara. It belonged to Italy until 1947. It, then it uh, passed under uh, Yugoslav uh, sovereignty and now is a beautiful uh, Croatian city. We have uh, such city walls in Sibenik, in uh, Italian Sebenico, and also finally in Cotto, Montenegro. Montenegro. Cotor is uh, called in Italian Cattaro. Now, your question is uh, probably why am I mentioning exactly these uh, six fortified cities to you? 
exactly because there was a, an international cooperation project between three countries, Italy, Croatia and Montenegro, to highlight, to defend, to promote this common cultural heritage left to these three states by the ancient Republic of Venice. Uh, they presented a joint initiative a few years ago to UNESCO and finally at the meeting in Krakow in July this year this uh, joint initiative by Italy, Croatia and Montenegro mm -hmm. was successful and these six city uh, walls were inscribed in uh, the list of the UNESCO heritage with a very nice uh, motivation I can give some uh, extracts of it to you. Uh, UNESCO based the decision on uh, these ideas uh, that these Venetian works of defense, today located in three different countries, between the 16th and the 17th uh, century, um, represent an extensive and innovative defensive networks established by the Republic of Venice and which is of exceptional historical, architectural and technological significance. They provide an exceptional testimony of uh, military culture which evolved within the Republic of Venice in the 16th and 17th century involving vast territories and interactions. Very important is the transnational character of this uh, cultural heritage because again three states are uh, concerned and in each of these three states there are provisions to protect this heritage. For instance, in Italy, the walls I showed to you are protected by the Cultural and Landscape Heritage Code of 2004. In Croatia, there is an Act on the Protection and Preservation of Cultural Property. In Montenegro, there is a law on the Protection of Cultural Property. But what I like to underline again is the transnational and international character of this cooperation because uh, the three countries in December 2015, so nearly two years ago, signed a transnational memorandum of understanding uh, to provide a coordination between the three of them and to establish an international coordination team to protect, supervise and manage this uh, heritage. Also to uh, protect it from physical decay, to improve uh, the uh, um, preservation of it and also to face particular situations related to visitor pressures. When we mention Casanova, let us think that Casanova during his life probably saw these buildings. So these are in a way the physical structures of the period in which Casanova lived. Very powerful, transnational character, ranging from Central Europe to the Eastern Mediterranean, the physical setting in which our Casanova lived. So, that was part number one of our presentation of tonight, mm -hmm. sort of description of a multinational state ranging from Northern Italy to Cyprus, in which Italian, Slavs, Albanians, Greeks lived together and originated a very original culture giving birth to an important European state of that period, endowed with a number of structures, political structures, defense structures, and impressive buildings. Physical setting. With that I'm done, and I would ask Paul Kirby to take the floor, to make a step forward and tackle the second circle, which is about culture under the specific form of music. All the floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador Novello, and uh, I want to thank also uh, the director of the Italian Cultural Institute, Matteo Fazzi, for being such a wonderful host. Um, I am actually the theme team for tonight's presentation because it would have been, of course, natural to have the ensemble here, or at least part of the ensemble. But the ensemble is, uh, by all measures, a, a victim of its own success because they're all out working this evening. Uh, the Oslo Chamber Academy is a, a or, or the Oslo Comet Academy is the premier woodwind ensemble of Scandinavia, 
in one of the oldest standing woodwind, woodwind ensembles of Northern Europe. Um, that is to say that it's an international uh, ensemble. We have, uh, we have one French person, one Belgian, one Italian, a bassoon player, Alessandro Caprotti is, is Italian. We have, uh, we have two Finns, we have two Norwegians, and a Swede in the ensemble. So it's highly international character. The ensemble is drawn from the premier, from the soloists of the woodwind sections, from the major orchestras in Oslo. The Oslo Philharmonic, the, uh, the radio orchestra, and the opera orchestra. Uh, in addition, well, I should say a little bit about, the, about what the harmony ensemble is. The harmony ensemble is a module of the orchestra, the modern symphony orchestra, which encompasses the woodwinds. It's two oboes, two clarinets, uh, two bassoons, usually two French horns, and sometimes a solo flute, and, uh, and a, and a contrabass, a, a bass player, sometimes percussion also. And the woodwind or the harmony ensemble was is sometimes called the, the MP3 player of the 19th century. Because it was an ensemble that was highly portable, could play anything that was put in front of it, could play loudly outside, and was highly resistant to temperature change, which strings are not sometimes, and was, uh, as I said, a highly versatile ensemble. And all of the court, uh, all of the courts in, of the capitals of Europe who had resident orchestras typically had a harmony ensemble with them because it was impractical to go out to uh, a day in the field or a day a festival outside with the, with the whole string section because of course the violins could be out of tune and they wouldn't project well. But so they had this ten-member supergroup of highly competent musicians who could adapt themselves. To not only music written for their instrument, but written but written for all the all the other instruments. Um, I love this ensemble. I worked for this ensemble. I've been managing this ensemble for three years now. And what I love about this ensemble is that I could take a, them and put a Beethoven symphony on an oil platform with one single helicopter. With ten people, it's fully complete. And I'll play a couple of examples a little bit later on. Why Casanova and why Venice and why the Oslo Chamber Academy? Well, we're connected in a lot of different ways. What's interesting, we were talking about this earlier, is that while the, most of our repertoire happens to be the, uh, Viennese or German or French, uh, it's all Italian music. Yeah? Because when we talk about Mozart, and Beethoven and Haydn, this music really is Italian in nature. It's Italian, most of it in origin, whenever we talk about playing Italian or Mozart <coughs> opera overtures, of course, there's a huge Italian influence. In this case with Casanova, it's very, very interesting that one of the things we're going to play on Sunday night is some of the, um, you, you remember the, the opera Don Giovanni, where the end of the opera there is the uh, there's the dinner, the fabulous dinner that he's hosting, where eventually the commendatore comes in, and that's the famous moment, Don Giovanni. <coughs> yeah? Well, in that scene is an orchestra on stage who's playing little bits of, of different, uh, different Mozart operas, yeah? There's actually a wonderful spot where they start to play a little bit of Non Pilgrim, Fai Falon, Niamo Rosso, which is from another Mozart opera, and Giovanni, Don Giovanni says something to the effect of, Oh, stop that! I hate that music. It's so boring. Yeah. So Mozart was was talking was uh, was slamming his own music in a very clever way. But Casanova, why Casanova is so important? Well, Casanova for us in this project is an important lens through which we are able to see 19th century music and late 18th century music in such a way that we would necessarily miss because it takes the mind of a cosmopolitan thinker, of a multifaceted, talented individual, the true Renaissance man, born probably 200, 300 years too late, actually, to really view the genius of Mozart and the effective genius of what this music was capable of doing. In the case of Casanova and Mozart, 
there is also a very particular and specific influence, which is that Mozart's uh, librettist, the one who wrote the, the manuscript for the text for the operas Don Giovanni and Così van Trutte and uh, uh, Le Nozze di Figaro, is the one and only Lorenzo da Ponte. Lorenzo da Ponte had a fantastic career also. He lived during Mozart's time, ended up teaching at the University, Columbia University in New York. So he's really lived all over the world, but also had a very good friend in, in Casanova. Casanova is probably, has probably written half of the libretto or the story to Don Giovanni. Which is very, very interesting because in that juxtaposition we have two sides of the of the Latin lover. We have the creative Latin lover who was capable of doing many, many things in Casanova and the, and the predatorial nature of Don Giovanni. So it is almost as if Casanova, in a way, is working out his darker nature in by writing in the character of Don Giovanni, helping Lorenzo da Ponte. But not only did he help write half of the, 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 uh, the libretto for Don Giovanni, he was also present in, in Prague for the first performance. And what's interesting is that the reason that the, uh, that the piece was performed at, at all was probably due, in fact, to the intervention of Casanova. Because Mozart was such a, such a, a, a we can say it in Norwegian, a rotoko, he was such a mess that he was, the, the premiere is supposed to start at 8 o'clock and it's 7 o'clock in the evening and he's still writing the overture. Yeah? And he got so flustered and panicked that he locked himself in a closet in the theater in Prague. And the musicians and singers became panicked. And they said, we're not going to stand for this. We're walking. There's not going to be a premiere. There's not going to be a famous premiere of Don Giovanni in Prague. And Casanova, because of his charisma and his knowledge of, this, of the, the nature of being on stage instinctively, he was, he was able to talk the cast and, and orchestra into staying in their places while Mozart finished the overture. So we actually owe not only the half of the libretto of Don Giovanni to Casanova, we also owe the premiere to, to Casanova. But in a larger sense, why we are talking about Casanova in this way is that Casanova's whole life was based on music. When you look up his, uh, his, uh, his, his memoir, you can scan the memoir, you can search in it, and he mentions the word music almost 100 times. In, in a relatively short memoir, that's a significant, a, a significant amount. And what we find is that there is something in the power of music that was able to capture not only Casanova in his time, but his personality and that space between the words that only music is allowed to fill. Yeah? One of the wonderful things about music is that I can stand here and the way I'm pacing, because I'm nervous and speaking without notes, my feet are making a percussion on the floor. Yeah? So in a way, if somebody were to write down all of the notes that my feet are making on the floor, you could put it, write it down on a piece of paper, put it in an envelope, open it again in a hundred years, and, and somebody could play And so you have the picture of a nervous man standing in front of a group of people talking. Yeah? And so that's the wonderful thing about the chamber music of Mozart as it relates to Casanova. Because what we see is we see a unique portrait of Casanova. Not only with words, and not only with sounds, but also the rhythm of the, of the breathing of the individuals that inhabited Casanova's life. And we cannot explain the effect that that has on the brain, except that we can somehow begin to physically internalize all of the things that Casanova experienced. It's really, really wonderful. Let me consult my notes quickly. Uh, the Norwegian, uh, or the also Chamber Academy, we do this, this is part of our stock in trade, which is to view history and to view art through the lens of the chamber ensemble of woodwinds. And the reason this is important is because it's highly portable and we allow ourselves to adapt other kinds of music. I'm going to play something here if I can get my... It's amazing to think that we have the, the world's music in our pockets and most of us are exchanging pictures of our dinner 
and our cats. <laughs> but that's how it works, I suppose. Let's see here. I, well, I just sort of going to play a, 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 a little bit of a... Yeah. This is not related to Casanova, but I want to I give an example of how we can digest larger works of other composers. This is a, 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 a piece that you probably have all heard before. Yeah. Beethoven, number seven, second movement, yeah? Full strings. This is a wonderful, wonderful orchestra in Canada, Tafel Musik, which is a period instrument orchestra. So let's imagine that Beethoven had a musical idea. Yeah? And Beethoven, because of brilliant structural tactician was able to structure this musical idea for a large group of people. He builds it up, creates a picture in sound, but always sublimating his gift of melody to the structure of the orchestra. A little other color in the orchestra, we get, we get a change, but we always had this yearning for being called into this highly individual and highly personal use of melody. Just a little bit more of this so we get a taste of it, what the orchestra tastes like, yeah? And what makes this a great orchestra is that these street players are playing into the sound of each other, yeah? So they are bound to each other by playing by playing in such a way that makes their teamwork much more important. Good. Now, one of the recordings that we have also Chamber Academy has, of which I am so proud, is a transcription, an arrangement of the Beethoven Seventh Symphony. That's only two bassoons and a bass. And already what we have is a highly personal view on the melody because they are not bound to coordinating the sound with the other members of the, of the, of the orchestra. This is one of the songs that we will hear. Now, what I've discussed with the Beethoven, no. what I've discussed with the Beethoven is how we can take a, a large orchestral sound and narrow it down into ten instruments. But we also go the other way, because this is a song 
composed by Mozart for uh, soprano and uh, and uh, and uh, fortepiano. And it is the story of a woman named Louisa who is burning her love letters from her lover. She's confused, doesn't understand what he's left, and she's burning, she's consigning them to the flames. But what we've done in this case is rather than taking the lens and going this way, we've taken a small piece of chamber music and broadened it out with ten instruments. So this is the original recording. <laughs> Esperanto, no, that's, that's fine. Okay. 
<laughs> you meant Esperanto before English? Or? No, first, first, of Esperanto. first of all. Sorry for jumping in, but Esperanto is something which I really value. Uh, now, Professor Pitts will talk about Esperanto in Norwegian. I want it, it that way because tonight it's an international evening in which we speak Italian, Venetian, French, Esperanto, English, and music. So that's really what, what, what we, we wish. Uh, but first, I would really love to, to seize this opportunity to say again a few words about Esperanto, which is an international language established in 1887, suggested in 1887. Uh, by one single man, a Polish doctor, Polish uh, eye doctor, Zanehoff, he suggests this language not to replace other languages, but as a medium of international communication between people uh, whose mother languages are different. Was it a utopia, a dream? Yes, in a way, but it came true to an extent. Some two million people use it today. There is no single day in the year without a conversation being held in Esperanto, a congress or international meeting being held in Esperanto. Some examples. Um, the Chinese official radio broadcasts every day in Esperanto, the Vatican radio three times a week, the Cuban radio every week. I have a beautiful uh, app here, yeah, application. The name is Amikumi, through which you can get in touch with uh, people speaking Esperanto in your surroundings, wherever you are, to which you can get hold of people who share this interest with you. Uh, what else? UNESCO. I mentioned UNESCO before. UNESCO publishes uh, a journal four times a year. It's really more a book than a, than a journal. It's some um, 100 pages. In uh, the six official languages of UNESCO, English, French, Spanish, Russian, Arabic, Chinese, and now Esperanto. Esperanto is one of the seven languages in which UNESCO publishes uh, its, uh, its uh, uh, activities. Um, so, tonight our idea was uh, to stress uh, the internationality of uh, Giacomo Casanova, offering readings of uh, translations from his works in uh, two international languages, two international languages by definition, in a way. your native language, uh, English and, uh, and uh, Esperanto. So I, I went for the big catch and I asked the Professor Pitz, who is a member of the Academy of Esperanto, to be with us tonight and all of us first with a small introduction to this language in Norwegian again, and then a reading of some minutes uh, from the Esperanto translation of the biography, autobiography of Giacomo Casanova. Mi ricordo da anche Salvi, estimato professore, per via a Fabrizio e grazie per il mio invito, tu ci spero, che invita a Svinne, veni, che hai parole a lì, anche un orvede per il internet di Esperanto, che hai poste l'out legante e la speranta versione della autobiografia di Giacomo Casatova. Danco un professore. I don't know if there is any Norwegian in the audience. Uh, if not, I should have done this in English. But uh, we are in Norway, so I think it's fair that I present Esperanto as I have prepared in Norwegian. Som ambassadør Novello har sagt, ble Esperanto publisert i 1887 under navnet Lingua Internazia. Den første lærerboka ble utgitt under pseudonymet Doktoro Esperanto, som på det nye språket betyr Doktor Håpende. Språket ble derfor kalt Esperantos språk, Esperantos språke, og til slutt bare Esperanto. Grunnleggeren av språket, L.L. Zamenhof, som ledde fra 1859 til 1917, mente en grunn til fiendskap mellom folkene var at de ikke forsto hverandre språklig. Han ville derfor lage et språk som var så lett at alle skulle kunne lære det uten å være spesielt språkbegavet. Det han håpet på var at dette språket skulle være et språk for alle, ikke for eliten. Det måtte være nøytralt og ikke diskriminerende. 
Når det vi kaller et etnisk språk, altså et nasjonalspråk eller naturlig språk, eller hva det vil, når det fungerer som internasjonalt kommunikasjonsmiddel, vil de som har det som morsmål ha et overtak over de andre og utøve en slags språklig imperialisme. Esperanto er laget for å være et kulturelt møtested. De fleste som bruker det har lært det som fremmedspråk. Bare få har det som morsmål, og da i tillegg til språket som omgir dem. Alle som snakker Esperanto er altså minst tospråklige. Både det at Esperanto er så lett å lære, og det at Esperanto ikke utsetter brukerne for språklig imperialisme, gjør at kommunikasjonen på Esperanto skjer mer på like fot enn på en kommunikasjon på andre språk. Nå har jeg påstått at Esperanto er lett å lære. Hva er det som gjør Esperanto så lett å lære? Den svenske filologen Ebbe Wilborg sa i et radioforedrag at i annen halvdel av 1800-tallet var språksituasjonen i Europa slik at det ikke var nødvendig å oppfinne et internasjonalt språk. En kunne rett og slett bare utvinne det. Det var det i sammen om fjoret. Han tok elementer som var kjent fra andre språk, systematiserte dem og forkastet det han anså som kompliserende ballast. Jeg nevner kort fire punkter. For det første, det er samsvar mellom ortografi og uttale. For det andre, det fremgår av et ords endelse, hvilken ordklasse det tilhører, om det er et substantiv, et adjektiv eller et verb, for eksempel. Kan du bøye ett verb, kan du bøye alle. For det tredje, bruken av det vi kaller affikser, altså forstavelser og etterstavelser, er systematisert på Esperanto. Vi har dem på andre språk også. På norsk er for eksempel det motsatte av lykkelig, ulykkelig, prefikset u. Men vi bruker ikke det systematisk. Vi kan ikke si å uelske når vi mener å hate. På Esperanto er det systematikk. Lykkelig heter Felicia, ulykkelig mal Felicia, elske Ami, hate mal Ami. Dere får eksempler på det i det jeg leser etter hvert. Med det systemet reduseres antall groser som må plukkes. Og det fjerde og siste punktet jeg vil nevne, er at mange ord, særlig fremmede ord, er felles for flere språk. De brukes på Esperanto og letter innlæringen av språket ytterligere, innlæringen av kunst. Det er blitt konstruert mange språk, såkalte planspråk, både før og etter Esperanto. De fleste er skrivebordsprosjekter, som har vært teoretisk ganske vel funderte, men som ikke har fungert så godt i praksis. Zarnhoff nøyde seg ikke med å konstruere språket teoretisk, men han prøvde det også ut i praksis. Han var ikke fornøyd før han fikk språket til å flyte, og før han klarte å skrive velklingende dikt på det nye språket, og å tenke ubundet på det. Det er mye mer jeg kan kunne si om Esperanto, men det har vi ikke tid til. Hvis dere vil ha flere opplysninger, kan dere gå på internettsiden esperanto.no. Men jeg vil bare si til slutt at av alle landspråkene som er lansert, er Esperanto det eneste som er i daglig bruk, ikke bare som praktisk kommunikasjonsmiddel, men også som litterært og kulturelt uttrykksmiddel. Det siste vil jeg gi dere en prøve på nå, ved å lese forordet til Casanovas selvbiografi, oversatt til Esperanto av Carlo Minaya, som altså har italiensk som det ene morsmålet sitt, og som er født i en Esperanto-familie, og faktisk er født med Esperanto som hjemmespråk. L'alleganto che io amo spensi, vidos e ci memorazioni, che tu mi avivo, mi ne niam avis precisan zero, che tiam, sola criterio che un esecris, 
secretario de Nomo, este es la llena. Mi lasis me importa que el avento me chovis. De que yo da travivarlo y este es causa que se independa sin tener. Mi hay mis aventuras, sin que mi hay buen chance, pruebas a mí que en ti mundo, cae en la campo espirita, cae en ti física, bono nas que ya se el mal bono, sin que el mal bono de bono. Mi hay errado y montros a la meditemulo y la du contrasta y goyo y al instruo siguen y la granda harto sin tenis en la hora meso. Necesas nur hagi curado, char forto sen menfido utilas al menio. Tre ofte mi vidis que felicio fala su min que el consecuencio de algo mal saja que estos de vinta me conduce en abismo, que hay tan neesparante y prochoy a mí mismo, me dan que es Dios en protio. Sed mi vida es un caos grande y mal feliz, y nasquidi el conducto modera y saja. Tío, sin duda, me humiligis, sed certa que me estis de la trava flanco, me facile consoligis. Malgra ci solida e morala e baso, ne è terra frutto della santa e principio e radicchiata in mia coro, mi è stato d'un la tutta d'auro del mio vivo, vittima della senso. A me ci ha piaciuto spiri la transversa e strato, che mi ci ha vivis e la erano, con nura consolo mi stis, que me trovillas en ti. Tial, cara leganto, me esperas que vi tú te ne vidos en mi historia oscuro y de maldezo y arrogantezo, se ya trovos la traito y de reala, generala, confeso. Ech, se en el estilo de mi ara contado, vi de Marcos nec el estilo de Pento Faranto, nec la plena contrición de tío que urgillas confesantes y alieta en triponado y estas pecos y leyunado mi ridas y ili que el vividos que el seguí estas bona vi ili en prividos con mi vividos que a mi exíos que tío foye que a mi cesis mi ne faris al mi trota zorgo y tri trompado al stultuloi, friponoi, al malsaguloi. Concerne chi omni faris cum virinoi, temes pri reciprocai mistificoi, pri chiui omni ne hago considero. Char chi am internetidas amo, cutime omni mistificas unula aliam amba franche. Se la afero sta a tutte a vie che non concerna la struttura. Mi ci am gioias che a mi repensas di ci o i foio e che a mi il infaligi se mi hai reto. Char il estas insolenta e che è mal modesta e gis de fio della spirito. Se te o mi vengas la spirito che a mi trompa struttura que estas venco que un valoras atingi, char estructulo estas quirasita, que un inesias de que un flanco de ataque. Trompe estructulo, do, estas tasco inda y inteligentulo. Tio que un elmetis en mi ansando, ec de mi nasquillo, neven que plan, mal amon contra un chi rasaccio, esta sta fatto che mi ida stulta chi un foie chi am al mi o casas frequenti chi uloi. Mal sama i della struttuloi male, esta sta sens chi uloi, chi ui estante ti hai un pro manco de educhigio, giuas mi am tutan estimon. Mi rencontri schelcaen, che io esistevo, buon morai, che io in sia nessio, 
ne estis senspritaj. Ili similas okuloj, kiuj estus belegaj sen katarakto. Cara leganto, la tono de ci anta parolo diro sa mi clare chio mi intensas fare. Mi gien scrivis, char mi volas che li nincono anta o mi legi. Nur ce cafeio cae tal mangioi o mi conversazias cum ne conato. Tac, folo prezzo. Many thanks, Professor Pritz, for this uh, rare opportunity. And uh, now I call uh, in sequence Stefanie uh, Kushner, uh, who incidentally is my wife, for the reading in French language. Then we will have uh, Sergio Scapin for Italian and Venetian, and Paul Kirby for English. Please. <laughs> So I'm trying to read some uh, parts of Histoire de ma vie, which is in Menonis, which was um, published after, actually after, 30 years about, uh, after the death of Rosa uh, Nova. Uh, it was published in different editions. The first time it was kind of a reduced uh, edition because um, it was published in Germany then, in German. Um, and it was on a black list because uh, people were not allowed to read these um, well, kind of uh, explicit uh, mm -hmm. things about his life. Um, the uh, original um, text of uh, Casanova's uh, Histoire de ma vie was published actually only in 1960. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now we have the possibility, because La Pliade, after uh, made a new edition, I think only in 2013 or something, uh, so we have the possibility to read this now in original. Um, I could not find all the original uh, the texts um, from, from the very new part, but I think well, the interesting things um, are also to be found uh, in, the, in the first edition, which was... Uh, 30 years after his death. So um, we listened to, I think the professor uh, presented to us a part of the introduction of the uh, Histoire de ma vie, as far as I am, so it was not all. Um, and there is one part I would like to read to you in French, which is uh, taken out of the same part, so you might find some more. He presents himself. And he justifies his whole lifestyle in this first part in order not to get this uh, uh, Histoire de ma vie um, understood in the wrong way because he was not only, the, as uh, the ambassador said, not only the woman, womanizer, he was not only the. So he was a philosopher, and I'm trying to uh, make you understand this by reading different parts, all taken from the first volume. Um, the Histoire de ma vie has nearly 4,000 pages. I did not read them all, <laughs> but, uh, Well, so I chose some which hopefully will be representative. Malgré le son de l'excellente morale, fruit nécessaire de divins principes enracinés dans mon cœur, j'ai été toute ma vie la victime de mes sens. Je me suis pu à m'égarer. J'ai continuellement vécu dans l'erreur, n'ayant d'autre consolation que celle de savoir que j'y étais. Ainsi, j'espère, cher lecteur, que bien loin de trouver dans mon histoire le caractère d'une imprudente, je pense, vous n'y trouverez que celui qui me convient à une confession générale, sans que, dans le style de mes narrations, vous trouviez ni l'air d'un pénitent, ni la contrainte de quelqu'un qui rougit d'avouer ses faudaines. 
Ce sont des folies de jeunesse. Vous verrez que j'en ris, et si vous êtes bon, vous en rirez avec moi. The second part is chosen from uh, one of his many, many, many uh, descriptions of his adventures. Uh, mm, whilst he is sitting in a coach with his landlady, who must be much older than him, and they're supposed to go for a visit uh, when suddenly a thunderstorm comes up. Le ciel était beau quand nous partîmes, mais en moins d'une demi-heure, il s'éleva un orage de l'espèce de ceux qu'on voit fréquemment dans le midi, qui ont l'air de vouloir bouleverser la terre et les éléments, et qui finissent en rien, le ciel redevenant serein, l'air étant rafraîchi, de sorte qu'ils font beaucoup plus de bien que de mal. « Ah, ciel !» s'écria ma fermière. Nous allons essuyer un orage. Oui, lui dis-je. Et quoique la calèche soit couverte, la pluie abîmera votre bel habit. J'en suis fâché. Patience quant à l'habit, mais je crains le tonnerre. Bouchez-vous les oreilles. Et la fourre. Postillons, allons quelque part nous mettre à couvert. Il n'y a des maisons, monsieur, qu'à une demi-lieue d'ici. Et avant que nous puissions les atteindre, l'orage sera passé. Il poursuit tranquillement son chemin, et voilà les éclairs qui se succèdent, la foudre qui gronde, et ma fermière qui tremble. La pluie commence à tomber à verse. J'ôte mon manteau pour nous couvrir par devant, et au même instant, et ébloui par mon éclair, nous voyons tomber la foudre à cent pas de nous. Les chevaux se cabrent, se cabrent et ma pauvre compagne est saisie de convulsions spasmodiques. Elle se jette sur moi, me serre étroitement. Je me baisse pour relever le manteau qui était tombé et profitant de la circonstance, je la découvre. Elle fait un mouvement pour repasser sa robe, mais d'un instant, un nouveau coup de tonnerre éclate et lui ôte la force de se mouvoir. Cherchant à la courir, couvrir de mon manteau, je l'attire à moi et le mouvement de la voiture, ce moment, ce mouvement, elle tombe sur moi dans la position la plus heureuse. Je ne perds pas de temps et faisant semblant d'arranger ma montre dans mon gousset, je me prépare de son côté, sentant que si elle ne m'empêchait pas bien vite, il ne lui resterait aucun moyen de m'échapper. Elle fait un effort. Mais la retenant, je lui dis que si elle ne faisait pas semblant d'être évanouie, le postillon verrait tout en se tournant. Et lui laissant le plaisir de m'appeler un pic, mauvais sujet et tout ce qu'elle voulut, je remportais la victoire la plus complète que l'athlète ait jamais remportée. Yeah. And at the end, uh, the, uh, one part of the, the end of the first uh, volume, um, he's supposed, I think he's coming out of church with some uh, lady, Madame F. Um, and uh, he's describing out in a philosophical part of his text uh, what he's thinking about love. <coughs> en descendant l'escalier, elle appuya sa main toute nue dans la mienne. C'était la première fois que j'obtenais cette faveur. Un doigt, de, un, un doigt de lignée, si j'en si tirais bon augure. En quittant ma main, elle me demanda si j'avais si la fièvre, car, me dit-elle, vous avez la main brûlante. Lorsque nous sortîmes de l'église, je lui offris ma main pour aider à monter dans la voiture de MDR, que nous rencontrâmes par hasard. Aussitôt que je l'eus quitté, je me hâtai de rentrer chez moi pour respirer en liberté et me livrer à toute la joie de mon âme, car je ne doutais plus d'être aimé. 
et je ne pensais pas que MDR pût rien refuser à Madame F dans cette circonstance. Qu'est-ce que c'est l'amour J'ai lu bien du verbiage antique sur ce sujet. J'ai lu aussi la plupart de ce qu'on en dit, les modernes, mais ni tout ce qu'on en a dit, ni tout ce que je m'en suis dit moi-même, et pendant que j'étais jeune, et maintenant que je ne le suis plus, rien, rien ne me fera avouer que l'amour soit une pacatelle ni une vanité. C'est une espèce de folie, oui, mais sur laquelle la philosophie n'a aucun pouvoir. C'est une maladie à laquelle l'homme est sujet à tout âge et qui est incurable si elle atteint dans la vieillesse. Amour, être, sentiment indéfinissable, Dieu de la nature, douce amertume, amertume cruelle, amour, monstre charmant qu'on ne peut définir et qui, au milieu de mille peines que tu répands sur la vie, celle l'existence de tant de plaisirs que sans toi, l'être et le néant seraient unis et confondus. Il cuore della sposa. 
ma la di lei virtù seppe occupare il seggio del sentimento. Giustina adempiva ai doveri di sposa con tanta e si dolce condiscendenza che Marco poté credersi amato. Ma una felicità di cui era in possesso e per cui ottenere non gli faceva più di mestiere l'usare attenzioni, non poté mantenerlo per lungo tempo soddisfatto. Non era ancora scorso un anno dal giorno dei suoi sponsali che cominciò ad andare in traccia di nuovi passatempi, vago di procurarsi piaceri assai più tumultuosi di quelli che Imeneo gli faceva provare tra le braccia di Giuliana. Non fu indifferente la negletta sposa al raffreddamento del marito. A benché ella non l'amasse, egli non poteva esserne aveduto, onde sembrava alla bella di non meritare un abbandono. Gli interessi della beltà non sono a giovine donna, men cari di quelli del suo proprio cuore. Ok, desiderio. <ride> perché essendo io veneziano mi costa assai meno fatica che se avessi dovuto scriverla in idioma toscano che se so, so a stento perché non lebbi dalla natura ma procurai di acquisirlo con lo studio mi parve cosa più facile scrivendo in veneziano d'essere il primo scrittore nel mio dialetto di quello che poter annoverarmi seduto a Scanna nell'ultimo luogo fra Toschi, se mi danno pazienza. Uh, this translation is actually a very, is a very high composition and one of the best uh, in the rich uh, Venetian literature. And uh, uh, Casanova can be placed among the writers who have uh, nobility. This uh, literature, this Venetian literature. I know we have to read some uh, some extracts of the, some strophe of the Iliad in Venetian dialect or Venetian language. Grandea che covole se tanto cara del gran figlio de Peleo cantè la bile colera rovinosa orrenda, amara despeto atroce dell'ardente Achille cantè quanto quei via a costa cara all'anime dei mille eroi e mille morti e all'orido inferno condannai da cani e corvi i colpi devorai Quando che penso a quella gran rovina, sono sforza a dir che Dio così ha molesto, perché si ben che l'uomo ha mente fina, quando che il vuol far mal a quello e a questo, nonostante esse calma, e non combina un cumulo di guai tanto funesto. 
donc è sta causa un Dio. Musa sincera, disede in cortesia, sto Dio chi è c'era? Sto Dio febo le sta fio della tona ed è quello che fa piovere tempesta, che fa sioni e bissa bove e tona. Agamenon in giuria manifesta, fa a crise e non rispetta la persona. Crise che è prete e che ha buona testa, appella febo e febo dà sentenza che i greghi abbia a soffrire la pestilenza. L'istoria è questa. Sto pre crise arriva e dritto e va verso l'armada Achea, che in fassa Troia unita al sete liva, in tende e in barche in porto de Sigea. Pigliar sacerdotesco e coversiva, scetto e portava, e corona d'Altea, verde, lustra e dell'Avra non contesta, come Apollo, suo Dio, la porta in testa. Copia dei preziosissimi regali, porta con lui sto vecchio venerando, erbe, recami, stoffe e minerali, e tutto l'offre ai greghi rescattando suo figlio, che presumiera molti mali deve soffrire in quel penoso bando. A Menelao e Sinchina, a Ravenon a quei re tutti e il fasto bel sermon. A Ravenon, esempio di valore, principi che se qua vaghi di gloria, prego i dei che vi accorda il suo favore, che non combatte mai senza vittoria, possiedo tornare in Grecia con onore dopo Troia distrutta e vera storia dei celebri dell'Asia vincitori e dei troiani abbia tutti i tesori. Se pietà nei cuori vostri ha mai, ha mai lo sa, se per il Dio che servo avere rispetto, se avere guardo per la vecchia età e se sapere cos'è paterno affetto, se sentimenti ave d'umanità, animo eccesso e sensi eroici in petto, esordì generosi una preghiera e rendemmi una cara presoniera. Sta cara presoniera se mi fia, Criseida e mi di dolce sostegno, accette sti presenti in cortesia, che del buon cuore a rassegnare il regno, che i serva a riscattarla e che la sia rimessa in le mie mani e in altro regno che la regna con me che sono suo padre e che tanto versà l'arme a mare. Having been given the place of honor with one of the strangest languages pronounced tonight, the language, the English language, uh, I will read two short excerpts uh, which figure in the performance on Sunday night as kind of a preview, and then a little longer one. This is the first one is Casanova speaking about music. Music, everything is music, every sense, every thought, every memory. I continued on to Paris, I learned about the city's mysteries. I saw the court moving from Versailles to Fontainebleau for the summer. The city swelled and the theaters came to entertain the king and the court. Actors, singers, dancers followed the stream. I followed the season's first opera performance. The music was by Mouly. In the first scene, the famous singer gave a sudden and violent scream. I thought he had a bout of madness. I had to laugh. Had neither of the others heard the madness of the scene? The gentleman, a little bit farther away, asked me where I came from. Venezia. Ah! And which of the two actresses do you think is the most beautiful? Of course, this one over here. 
She has ugly legs. I cannot see them. And by the way, the legs are the first thing I cast aside when I look into a woman's beauty. The next one is about, uh, I received, actually, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm a proxy for the soprano uh, on Sunday night. It's the first time I've ever, as a tenor, stood in for a soprano. But <laughs> there we are. These are texts that I received from her that she will be reading on Sunday. Um, so, he, there's a, a woman in the performance on Sunday night that we don't meet except through the music of Mozart, which is a woman, Henrietta, who is apparently the only woman Casanova really was truly deeply in love with. And their three-month affair was an, an event that marked him for the rest of his life. And we don't know much about her in her full name, so she's French. They met in uh, Cesena in 1748. Uh, she was accompanied at that time by a Hungarian captain who was in the emperor's service. Here we are, what he says about Henrietta. Henrietta, Henriette, surprised and consumed me. I was completely obsessed and barely thought of anything else. At a concert in Parma, after the symphony, a beautiful duet between two God-given singers and a cello concerto, I see Henrietta getting up and deliberately moving away to one of the cellists. Could she please borrow his instrument? Henrietta sat among the musicians, took the bow and pulled the instrument. She placed between her thighs. She waited for the signal. The orchestra and Henrietta listened together to each other and received a brilliant applause. Henrietta did not even look at the score in front of her. Completely focused on the solo, one piece after another. Six works in total. Eager applause. I was deeply touched. Who was she? This woman in front of me. What had she done to me? The patio next to the garden received my tears. At the dinner table, Henrietta was able to tell me that she had been in the monastery, where she had learned to play cello, Although the pretense meant it was inappropriate for a woman to operate such an instrument. The next day, I bought a cello for him. From now on, she played every day. In the morning, she got up before me only in the silk slip she took. Her place at the balcony door, accompanied by the morning dawn and the bird song as she watched me away. Henrietta was vague about the details of her past, but during the next three months, which would be the happiest of my life, I gathered together a bit of her background. She had escaped a violent husband and an equally intimidating father-in-law. She would not admit it, but most likely she had left two young children in France, too. Now she gave up a life with me as a young adventurer who shared her views on life and passion. Perhaps that was what attracted me the most, a woman who had no intention of living with me forever. So the last one is something that we've been kind of on the borders of from his, the introduction to his, to his life. Towards the end of the life, he's clearly reconstituting his experience, codifying it as an alchemist would. He writes, By recollecting the pleasures I've had formerly, I renew them. I enjoy them a second time, while I laugh at the re remembrance of troubles now past and which I no longer feel. A member of this great universe, I speak to the air and I fancy, my, fancy myself rendering account of my administration as a steward is wont to do before leaving his situation. For my future I have no concern, and as a true philosopher, I never would have any, for I know not what it may be. As a Christian, on the other hand, faith must be leave without discussion, and the stronger it is, the more it keeps silent. I know that I have lived because I have felt, and feeling giving me the knowledge of my existence I know likewise that I shall exist no more 
when I have ceased to feel? Should I perchance still feel after my death, I would no longer have any doubt. But it would most certainly give the lie to anyone asserting before me that I was dead. A certain philosophy is full of consolation, and in perfect accord with religion, pretends that the state of dependence in which the soul stands in relationship to the senses and to the organs is only incidental and transient, and that it will reach a condition of freedom and happiness when the death of the body shall have delivered it from the state of tyrannic subjection. This is very fine, but apart from religion, where is the proof of it all? Therefore, I cannot, from my own information, have a perfect certainty of my being immortal until the dissolution of my body has already taken place. People must bear kindly with me if I am in no hurry to obtain that certain knowledge. Hmm. For in my estimation, a knowledge to be gained at the cost of life is a rather expensive piece of information. In the meantime, I worship God, laying every wrong action under an interdict which I endeavor to respect, and I loathe the wicked without doing them any injury. I only abstain from doing them any good in the full belief that we ought not to cherish serpents. As I likewise must say a few words respecting my nature and my temperament, I premise that the most indulgent of my readers is not likely to be the most dishonest or the least gifted with intelligence. <laughs> Sei ambasciatore Novello, professor Fritz, uh, Paul, Stefani, Sergio, many thanks for your contribution to this event uh, and to the knowledge of uh, the character of Casanova and to the mission of the Italian Cultural Institute in Oslo. We are not many tonight, but uh, the event uh, has been video recorded, then can be made available for a greater audience. So uh, maybe your unique uh, contribution to the knowledge of Casanova can be enjoyed by more people. So just to remind you, uh, don't miss the opportunity to attend the concert the day after tomorrow, this coming Sunday, 6.30 at Opera House. There you can enjoy uh, a free glass of wine, a wonderful concert and uh, opportunity to buy for 100 pounds uh, a new uh, CD. If you can't wait for the uh, glass of wine offer at Opera House, you can enjoy a free glass of wine here, courtesy offered by the Italian Culture Institute. Thank you very much.